I am Melissa Wigner. I am the CEO of Lighter Capital. Lighter Capital is the pioneer and leader in revenue-based financing for B2B SaaS companies. And today on the podcast, we're doing something a little different. We are going to speak with Lighter Capital's chairman, Mark Verissimo. Mark spent 24 years at Silicon Valley Bank. He held several senior leadership positions there, including chief risk officer, which was the position he held when he retired in 2016. Mark is going to provide um, some comments and opinion on what's happened in the last two weeks. I would love to start off with talking about your background and specifically, you know, when you came to Silicon Valley Bank and some of the different various roles you held there, including chief risk officer, which Notably, they did not have for most of 2022, but if we could just start there, that would be great. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Melissa. Actually, I started in Silicon Valley in the summer of 1981 between my first and second year at business school. And that was just the cusp of the venture capital world and growing. Because I believe in 1979, they changed the prudent investor rule in the U.S. that allowed pension managers, et cetera, to expand into alternative investments. And so that started a boom. I think when I was there, venture capital investing went from a billion to two billion and everybody's heads just exploded (laughs) because it was such such a big increase. That was with B of A because B of A at the time was the 800-pound gorilla in the certainly much smaller entrepreneurial ecosystem. If you had a company, you came to Bank of America. And I stayed with B of A until 1985. So that was two years after Silicon Valley Bank was founded in 1983. And in 1985, Bank of America got into financial difficulties every place else, but it affected them, affected us in the tech sector, and B of A decided to exit it. And so um, Silicon Valley Bank, at the time was pretty much the only institution that would work with young companies, 1985, 1986. So basically they just got all the companies their way, no competition. And then fortunately for me in 1992, the Fed came in and pushed out the first CEO of Silicon Valley Bank, Roger Smith. The bank had problems with systems. They had too much in commercial real estate. And they were one foot in the grave. And so in 1993, I interviewed with John Dean on his first day on the job and signed up. And I stayed there for 24 years, initially running the sales force for California, which at the time was probably about 80% or 85% of the bank at that point in time. How many people were in the bank, Mark, when you joined? When I joined, there was about 110 people. Wow. Um, in the bank. And back then you didn't have outsourced IT. So a good number of those people were were IT. Today you probably have two or three people in IT, not 40 people or yeah. 35 people, yeah. whatever we had. So it was a very small outfit. There was a few offices around the country, but basically people working in their basements at that point in time as rep offices. So I stayed until uh, 2000. I ran California. Then I moved over to the other side and did a variety of things, including interim CFO a couple times. Um, pretty much every part of the bank reported to me at one point or another. We were always mixing and matching stuff going on. And then since 2000, but really since about 2010, I became the chief risk officer, fully chief risk officer. Like everyone else, I clearly was impressed with the way the bank grew during the time I was there, and then particularly the time after I left. From 2016 to 2022, there was the explosive growth for the bank, which mirrored the explosive growth going on in venture capital, private equity. One of my positions is sitting in a trustee of my university's endowment pool. And I can tell you that when rates were zero, which they were for so long, Mm -hmm. that everybody was looking for yield. Um, Individuals, pension funds, University endowments, everybody. And where where they're finding it was alternative assets, whether it's private lending or it was um, private investments, private acquisitions, et cetera. That's where the money was was pushing to. So you saw this huge increase in both funds raised, and then you saw a huge increase in funds deployed over that time. And Silicon Valley Bank 
having a 50% market share in the venture capital marketplace for venture back deals together with what they were doing in private equity, together with the um, funding they were doing for the venture capital firms themselves, capital call lines, et cetera, just saw a huge increase in deposits. And so they, like a lot of other banks, were faced with lots of deposits. If I keep it in cash, I get zero or short term. If I go out 10 years, I can pick up maybe 160, 170 basis points. You know, there's a lot of pressure, both from investors, analysts, et cetera, to improve profitability. And having been on the side, sitting on a board, watching presentations being made, there were a lot of presentations with quote unquote stress testing. And I always was arguing with them over that. Not that I'm smarter than anybody else. It's just that I had to live through lending in the late 70s, early 80s when prime was 21%, mortgages were 23%, and I saw rates go up pretty quickly and drop rapidly. And I also knew there was a correlation between interest rates going up and decreases in venture PE investing. Because you know, at a zero risk-free rate, you can put a margin on top of that, and it's not bad. You, you raise the risk-free rate to 3%, 4%, 4.5%, all of a sudden that's another four and a half percent, you have to get beyond what your projections are. And so a lot of deals don't make the cut. And so you saw deal value start to go down, investments start to go down. And likewise, Silicon Valley Bank's deposits start to go the other way. So, but it, but to me, that's kind of banking 101. I mean, that's, that's how you have to think about your, as a bank, your balance sheet. And granted, zero interest rates, really inflated all the bank's balance sheets, all the deposits, but how do I manage prudently through it? So yes, you can blame it, but it's not an excuse. You still have to be able to, to manage. Yeah. And, and just for people who aren't maybe up to date, it feels like everybody that we talk to is up to date on the story, but maybe some of the listeners won't be, um, you know, Silicon Valley bank had 10 year treasuries, if they didn't have a need for cash, they could have held them to maturity and perhaps wouldn't have had the problems. They wouldn't be in the situation they're in today, but because they needed cash because of the shortfall in deposits, fewer deposits than, than forecasted, they had to sell those treasuries at a loss. So would this all have been averted if they had hedged those positions? And what would be the rough cost of hedging those positions? I mean, we've I've read... Um, some commentators say that the reason the positions weren't hedged is because it costs to hedge and that would cut into uh, profitability, which cuts into management bonuses. And that's why that's why these positions weren't hedged. But do you believe that has something to do with it and knowing you weren't inside the bank or that it was just an oversight that they didn't think there was a need to do that? And, and so there's a few questions there. But the first one is, if it had been hedged, if they had taken the the action to hedge these treasuries would there would we not be in this situation would still would Silicon Valley Bank still be business as usual? Well, there, there's different kinds of hedges, and certainly I'm learn, I've been learning a lot about the hedges. Um, certainly, in, at the bank I sit on the board of board of, but yes, they could have certainly mitigated a lot of that downturn with hedges, and they did have some hedges in place. They had about. 14 billion in hedges and they unwound them in, I think in 21 or 22, they unwound those hedges for a profit. Now it wasn't immediate. They had to amortize those over seven years or five years. So it wasn't an immediate hit, but it was amortization and they didn't replace them. So basically they had the portfolio, you know, as they'd say, naked um, sitting with that interest rate risk. So, and when you looked at it, 90 billion of it was, they called held to maturities. And when you put it in held to maturities, you don't have to adjust the value. Then the remaining 23, 25 billion was then available for sale. And available for sale goes through your equity section as it goes up and down. And so I think they got complacent, well, several complacencies. One was interest rates had been low for so long that people said, well, inflation is transitory, it's coming down. 
And so therefore the problem, because it started to rise in the third quarter, 2022, they would say, well, the rates are going to be coming down. So yeah, it's a short-term problem, but it'll go away or be drastically mitigated on my held to maturity. Available for sale, same thing, even though it's going through my income statement, I mean, more equity section, you know, it will come down. So they complacent there that rates were going to come back down. They also got complacent. I think they focused a lot on credit risk. So yeah, the treasuries. And then they held a lot of agency CMOs or mortgage-backed securities that are insured by federal agencies. And the problem with those is, and they had a good chunk of them, the duration also goes up. So not only do rates go up and you see reduced value, your cash flow getting re- re- being repaid back goes down. Now, certainly hedging could help, help that. I look at two things. One, when they first did it, hedging or just not doing as much? Saying, Jesus, I'm not, first of all, I'm not going to do it in such a tight order. I'm not going to put 90 billion or something out within a year or six months. I'm going to really ladder it out. And then I'm going to keep a chunk short term because I know my deposits are volatile. So I'm going to keep a nice cushion there um, so that I'll keep a one year, 1.3 year duration portfolio. And then, yeah, I'll put some out, you know, a little more distant like that. Now that would have hurt earnings. So you're right in that if I do that, it hurts earnings. If I do hedging, it hurts earnings. And if we think about that time, their stock was going through the roof, $600 a share, 650 700 close to $800 a share. And you get on that, that mindset that I've got to keep, keep things moving because I've got shareholders that are becoming more and more demanding on performance. So this would have caused them to really pull back and disappoint shareholders. It's not just shareholders, right? But it's employees. Yeah. So if I go back to the third quarter, so let's say you've done the 90 billion, you're unhedged, you've done the 25 billion available for sale, unhedged, what would I have done then? I would have um, raised equity. Now, clearly shareholders would not have been happy, but I would Mm -hmm. have raised equity. I would have started to slowly sell my available for sale for securities, slowly, not all at once, meter them out to get more liquidity. And then there's plenty of lines you can get from the Federal Home Loan Bank, the mm-hmm. Fed window, and other banks will lend money to you. You know, you put a collateral, you had all these great treasuries and mortgage-backed securities that were worth something, you know, chunk of money. I would put those up for collateral for lines of credit. So therefore, you're sort of fortifying your balance sheet to say, okay, deposits keep coming down. I will get more liquidity. I'm available for sale. I will borrow money to feed the cash I need if deposits deposits keep going down. And then I'd raise more equity to again offset those small losses I'm going to be taking there. Now that to me would have been, I would have started that in the third quarter. That because that's when deposits started to decline. I mean, yeah, if you look at their if you look yeah. at their rate of deposits, I mean, from I mean, I just looked at a chart from 2010. It's just up, up, and up, but kind of steady, yeah. steadily going up, and then it just <laughs> skyrockets. But then you see a little bit of a dip in third quarter. So, so did they just not recognize that as a potential trend? I mean, how was how was that missed? Or, I mean, what you I want to get back to something you said before in terms of a recommendation that there are these lines of credit from the federal government. Isn't, isn't that, a, if you were to go and draw on that line of credit, isn't that potentially a negative signal to the market and something that banks want to avoid doing? You know, not, oh, particularly not now, but it, no, not now, right? but, 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 but it but does affect your NIM, that interest margin. And they were getting a lot of pressure on the NIM because you borrow at the Fed window, you borrow that, they'll charge you 4%, 4.5%, you know, whatever the, 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 their rate is. So it's so it's harming your NIM. So you you if you're if you're just thinking about earnings, you're not thinking about survival, you're not thinking about covering deposits, you would do that. On the deposit side, if you listen to what they were saying in the third quarter, at the third quarter earnings, they were saying, well, we're tracking our um, Months liquidity and the burn rate of our companies, and it's slowing. 
And so, yeah, they thought that the degradation deposits would be less. And then you fast forward to what they said in January for December, and then their update quarterly, it was clearly they underestimated that, oh, companies are cutting their burn rate. You know, they're actually keeping their burn rate fairly high, and the new money's not coming in. In the third quarter, you could you could tell you knew that was going to happen because you saw the rates go up. And you saw venture capital investing start to fall off a cliff. And you just have to you know, interpolate and say, okay, if the, if the investing is falling off a cliff, then that directly affects my deposits. And my deposits, and the bank, you didn't have to go there. You, oh, you had, well, you had to go back 20 something years. But in 2000, venture investing went from 20 billion to 100 billion, then back down to 20 billion. SVB's deposits exploded in, when it went up to 100 billion money was pouring in the doors. When in fact at 20 million, our deposits plummeted. And certainly Greg Becker, the CEO was there for that. Um, mm. The president was not Deshno and the CFO was not, but clearly Greg and other people in the bank were there for that. So to me, that was something they, they should have been stress testing themselves. This was obviously coming. Yeah. Although I remember um, in, it probably was in September being at an SBB event and their chief economist was speaking and, you know, about the state of the market, because by that time we had seen a big decline in venture financings. Um, and, and, you know, they pointed out something that, that at least made me think this was different than 2001. Um, and that was, there was more dry powder, and I think there still is more dry powder in VC funds than there ever has been in the history of VC funds. So possibly you could you could look at that stat and think, okay, deposits, you know, VCs have to deploy capital or, or give it back to their LPs, right? So you, you, you could have looked at that. And that was the big message I remember back in September that SVB was getting out was that there's a lot of dry powder. Um, people, there may have, be a little slowdown, but you know, this, this isn't going to go away. This, this investment isn't going to go away. And in fact, it probably, you know, it's just a hiccup right now because there's not a lot of choice you have when you're sitting on an unallocated, you know, billion dollar fund other than deploying the money. You know, you can either give it back or deploy the deploy the money. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard, yeah, I heard the same thing. And I always have that a phrase where I say, you know, deep pockets, short arms. You know, they, yeah, they had deep pockets. They wanted to do it. The other dynamic, and again, if you go back to 2000, um, it dropped off heavily. To, uh, I think in 2022 versus 2000, I think there could have been some LP pressure to say, you know, just slow down. Because what was happening in overall portfolios, because I saw it on our site at UC Davis Endowment, that the alternative started to go beyond. So public markets adjust very quickly. They come down. You see it, you write it down. Private investments come down much more slowly. So what happens if your public investments come down and your private investments don't move, then their percentage of the portfolio gets bigger. And sometimes it gets bigger than what your parameters are. So yeah. I could see limited saying, you know, why don't you slow down a little bit? Because all of a sudden I'm out of whack. I've got too much in privates, not enough in publics. The other issue that goes on is, yeah, they, it typically gets a five-year deal. They don't actually draw the money. You get committed to put the money in there. Slowing down says, I still got, you know, maybe I still have three years or four years investment period left, so I can just wait it out. And then again, my limiteds might say, well, liquidity is a little tight right now. Again, if you slow down a little bit, you know, we don't mind. Again, go back to 2000, went up to 100 billion, went down to 20 and just sort of bounced around there for a while. There wasn't a quick. And what, what did they do differently in 2000? Did they foresee that deposits were going to shrink and, or did they just have more cash to cover their liquidity requirements? Yeah. I mean, one, we were very short term. So our, our investment portfolio was short term. We didn't have any duration risk at that time. In fact, it was largely short term treasuries, not even CMOs or MBOs, it was treasuries that were short term. And rates were high then and going down. So the opposite was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if you did have to sell, it would be at a profit. Yeah. Yeah. And and then our loan to deposit was, you know, uh, it's always usually been on the low side. So maybe 60% loan to deposits, you know, 65, maybe as much as 70, but typically it was lower. Like I think. In 2023, I think for SVB, it was like 42%. So 
So very loan, loan to deposit. So you could have things come down. And if you had short-term securities, we were just liquidating our short-term securities. Right. Yeah. And there wouldn't have been a loss on, on them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so getting back to today and you're saying in Q3 measures could have been taken that where we would have had a really different outcome. Um, was it, there's a lot written about this um, lack of a chief risk officer, I think for eight months of 2022, SVB did not have a, a, a chief risk officer. Again, this is a position you held for a long time at the bank. Um, how much would the chief risk officer have been involved? I know they're looking at overall risk in, in this particular risk versus, you know, I, I think of like they would be focusing on the risk of the portfolio and the risk of the loans. I mean, is this something that even if they had a chief risk officer in place, it, it still could have been missed or they wouldn't necessarily have been focusing on this area? Yeah, when I, this is, you know, things I've read in in the press was that the um, the chief risk officer, the, the, the risk management office got an MRA in two, late 2019 from the Fed. And it basically an MRA says, you need to do work. <laughs> we, you need to improve it. What is an MRA? It's uh, matters requiring attention. And so it's not, a, it's one step below an order, an order ser serious. An MRA says, you better fix this. And so clearly the, the unit was under some pressure there. Then my understanding, and this was reported, I think, in the Financial Times, might be the Wall Street Journal, that in early 2022, BlackRock came in and evaluated their risk management function with peers. And there was 11 different categories. And they were below peers in all 11. And they were significantly below in 10 of those. So I think warning flags, and I, so I I believe that the probably the chief risk officer asked in early 2022 to leave, and it just took a while for them to actually execute the agreement on leaving. So they're maybe they're out of you know, closer to a year without a chief risk officer. Then it was also reported that the board risk committee met 22 times during 2022. And normally you would expect that to be four, right? Quarterly, yeah, quarterly. Yeah, at maybe, most, yeah. Maybe someone's in the interim. I have a feeling that was all focused on dealing with whatever remained with the MRA or or the MRA augmented by the Fed with the BlackRock study. Saying, okay, how are we going to fix the process of our risk management? That size institution, the risk management function should have a skill set to challenge credit, to challenge um, finance department and what they want to do with the balance sheet, challenge operations, because at that size institution, you're supposed to have more of that infrastructure in place. So they should have done that. I have a feeling they're focused, again, on the mechanics while the house is burning in the back of them. The problem with the chief risk officer, when I was there and my successor, is you reported dually to the board and to the CEO. The, the issue is, is that that always puts you in a secondary position because a CEO will always have a better, more interaction with the board than you will and clearly more force. Uh, so I, it, it'd be a, a chief risk officer that was fearless and didn't mind losing their job, you know, yeah. to be able to, to fight through the CEO, the CFO, and probably the president. You know, those three were probably fine with what was going on. The only thing that, to me, if, if you had to do a structural change, I would do, so, you know, like internal audit, solid line to the board, dotted line to management. But, but that brings to a second level of, of oversight is the board. And when I look at Silicon Valley Bank's board, I don't know who would push back. And when I look at their backgrounds, I see some venture capitalists. I see, you know, a CEO of a, of a you know, entrepreneurial company. Um, yeah. I, I see an accountant. I don't see the skill set needed for someone to call out and say, hey, that looks dangerous to me. Don't do that. Yeah. And having served on several boards, and I know you have those kinds of board members aren't welcome, especially when you have a 12, 13 year bull market. If you have somebody yeah. who's yeah. constantly questioning, yeah. looking at the yeah. downside, they, yeah. you know, they're marginalized. 
right? Yeah. No, they get they get frozen out and put off to the side. And so, uh, and, and, and things had gone so well for so long. Because the other question you said, you know, how could people do this? And I go, well, you know, if you got, Greg took over CEO in 2011. Mike Deschanel, the president, was CFO at the time. They had had basically 11-ish years of unmitigated success and ever-increasing success. So we're all human beings. You know, you start to probably believe you are, you've got superior decision-making, which you probably do, but you forget the fact that the underlying market <laughs> is so positive and driving your business that you're, you're kind of riding along that wave with, with the underlying market. I remember when I worked at, I did an internship at Goldman and um, that was a bull market too. And I remember somebody saying, never mistake a bull market for brains. And that just <laughs> stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a perfect way to put it. Let's go to March 8th. The, the, at four, I think it was 4.15 Eastern time is when the news story breaks that Silicon Valley Bank had lost $1.8 billion in treasuries. And then everything you know, their stock went down um, significantly and after hours trading um, opened up and continued to fall on March 9th. And, and then it what's astonishing to me is how quickly this all happened. Yeah. So people were moving their accounts by uh, morning of March 9th. Um, and then the FDIC takes over March 10th, which is actually quite yeah. impressive how quickly they acted. But there's a lot that's been said about how Greg presented the situation. And, you know, the don't panic is what got everybody to panic. But but do you think that, do you think it, you know, given where they were at that point, they did have to sell, you know, they did have to, have to take a, a $1.8 billion loss on, on their treasuries. Do you think there's a different way he could have presented it that would have prevented, you know, the, the run on the bank? Yeah, I think, and this has happened because of, again, what I've been reading, again, what was reported in the FT is that on March 2nd, because um, it, it, Greg gave an interview to the FT on February 22nd, and the FT pushed back somewhat on this big unrealized losses in their portfolio. And he was pretty adamant, we're not selling it, so it's not a problem. Um, on March 2nd, Moody's, and this according to published reports, Moody's informed Silicon Valley Bank they were going to downgrade their ratings on their bonds. And so SVB asked for a week to make their case. And so Moody's was concerned about, one, the unrealized losses. Second, they, are, they were concerned about the NIM because all these securities were, you know, 1 point, 160 basis points, 170 basis points. It was holding down their NIM. So Moody's was concerned about the profitability of the company being able to absorb these losses. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine SUB got that word and they went into damage control and they said, what can we do quickly? And so I think they came up with this thing. I said, well, we'll sell our available for sale security. So we'll wipe off 25 billion of that exposure that Moody's worried about. By doing that, we'll be able to reinvest in, in higher interest rate instruments. So our NIM will improve. So we've got better profitability going forward. And this was all in the stuff that they presented. And so Moody will address two of Moody's issues and maybe get them to not downgrade it and will raise more equity. I think what people talk about is says, you know, yeah, what you should have done is raise the equity first. Don't raise it second. Raise it first. Um, shore up your lines of credit with Federal Home Loan Bank, everybody else, and then slowly sell your available for sale. So don't just do a big, because 1.8 billion basically popped out a year's of profit. I think they made 1.5 billion, 22. And just to clarify, the reason they did it so quickly is because they were trying to avoid the down, the downgrading. Is that? Uh, that was the inference in the FT article. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know anything beyond that, but it seemed to be pretty close to March 2nd. You'd get notified of that and where you are March 8th, March 9th, you're doing this big, this big flip of your position because mm -hmm. your position was, hey, we're not going to sell them. Well, then all of a sudden you're selling them. The Peter Thiel gets a lot of flack for what he did 
but what I understand, this is both reported and also what I've heard on the street, was that a lot. And that was by telling his portfolio companies to move their. Yeah, that a lot of other venture capitalists were also saying, we will um, publicly either say nothing or support the bank privately telling our companies to get their money out. Um, And as it turned out, Peter Thiel still had 50 million in the bank (laughs) when it it went under. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what what he was what he was doing there but but to me this is the first social media bank run so the last bank run was what 2008 ish or whatever we were all connected the way we are today and so bank runs are always dangerous they're always emotional and to me that's why you run a pretty tight ship in banking because you've always got this mismatch of asset liabilities and so that's your life but that the run but the runoff has been breathtaking because when they sold to Citizens Bank, they had 56 billion in deposits that Citizens Bank took over. My question is what happened to the what over 160 billion ish that they had before the run? And right. so 100 billion left. And that was after the Fed guaranteed 100 percent of deposits. And the version that I've gotten is that, 16 billion of the 42 got out and then the systems kind of froze. Froze, yeah. <laughs> whether they whether they really froze or whether someone said just cut the power, we're not doing anymore. Yeah. But then Friday morning, the reason the Fed came in was that the bank said they had a hundred billion waiting to go out. A hundred billion. You can't absorb a hundred billion going out. And that's why the Fed had to come in and, and take over. A couple other topics I wanted to touch on. One, you know, we look at Starbings Oxley came about as a result of, you know, some accounting scandals um, in the early 2000s, most notably Enron. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people say there was overreach in that. A lot of times the pendulum swings too far the other way when, you know, something goes wrong and try and regulate. And I know it was a boon for accounting firms and it's still a boon for accounting firms that that legislation that was put into place. And then we have, you know, the Dodd-Frank Act in 2007 and the CFPB in 2008 that were, you know, a result of the mortgage price, the subprime crisis. And, and now we have, you know, Biden calling for new banking rules. Um, so what do you think will happen? Are we going to end up in just, I mean, banks are already heavily regulated. Is it just going to get even more difficult for banks to, you know, do what they do, which is help consumers and, and businesses? Yeah, we always used to have a phrase was that you'd, you'd, you'd have a bad actor, you know, get out of the pen or the barn and just run around crazy. And then the regulators would close the barn door and then make all the all, all of us that stayed in the barn suffer. And so yeah. I, I do think that's going to happen because I I've seen you know clearly and then unfortunately it gets political. So then you get people lobbing shells on either side that you had Dodd Frank in 2008. And at the time a systemically important bank was 50 billion. Yeah. And then they would just throw the kitchen sink at you and went over 50. In 2018 they raised that to 250 billion. But because I've actually gone and read the regulation, from 100 billion to 250 billion, the Fed had the ability to put more severe stress testing as they saw fit and the risk of the institution. Silicon Valley Bank was always on the top of the list for risk for two reasons. One, we'd have spurts of fantastic growth, which the regulators, that's always a red flag. We didn't look like a typical bank, we didn't have huge commercial real estate which they considered safe. I always considered it risky, mm-hmm. but they considered it safe. We had all these loans to these tech companies um, and that was always spurious in their, their team. So we were always yeah. on the high risk. Second, like, plus then we were global and we had all these things to make us risky. So to me, they had the ability with their regulations to go in there and monitor them more closely. But somebody pointed out, I think it was a Wall Street Journal, they looked at the stress test that the Fed was asking banks to run. They were, you know, pandemic, climate change, credit risks, their you know, recession risks. None of them were interest rate risks, really strong interest rates, saying, hey, rates are going to go up 400 basis points in six months. What's going to happen to you? What do you think is going to happen right. to you? 
So you look at that and say, well, geez, you'd have to have a focus on stress testing interest rates from the Fed to then get the banks to think more about it and then move it on. So nobody was thinking that way. I think, unfortunately, it was only like Larry Summers and a few other you know, economists on the outliers that were much more pessimistic about inflation, interest rates, what was going on there. And there clearly wasn't enough view on that. So, so yeah, I think we are going to get more regular, well, you know, the, the hearings and always makes good, good press. Yeah. Um, but I always wonder, you know, they always take a shotgun and, you know, they blow away lots of stuff and, you know, maybe yeah. a, a rifle would be a better, a better way to pinpoint, pinpoint the problem. Because Enron, I remember we had, when Enron occurred, so this would have been 2000, 2001, we had an ex SEC commissioner come in and talk to the board at Silicon Valley Bank and Management. And his attitude is, yeah, there's going to be a lot of regulation that comes out of this. He says, the problem is there's laws on the books that could take care of this. You know, we have the laws on the books that if you enforce them, you would nip this in the bud. But he said, that's not the way we work. So you're going to get, and certainly we got a brunt of the, the Dodd-Frank, you know, overlay on top of it. Um, and then the other where you have when you have that, when you have a lot of regulation to that detail, is do you miss the forest for the trees? And you're so busy building all this. You know, that no one has chance to think about the overall risk. They're thinking about all these micro, micro risks they have. Yeah, that's that's a, a worry I have out of this. And then I, I want to just touch on, you know, the, the people at Silicon Valley Bank and the culture, because it what, what surprises me that this happened to this bank. There's a couple things. One, um, you know, I was a venture capitalist in when the dot-com crash happened and then also when the GFC happened and, and Silicon Valley Bank survived both of those. And we saw lots of actors that are lots of other um, banks and players that come into this venture debt space when the market's hot. And, you know, they pretty much all exited in 2001. And again, they all exited again in 2008. I mean, a few stuck around, but um, Silicon Valley Bank has been, you know, the one constant in this space. I mean, primarily because that was their only business or their core business, but, but, they're not a bank. I mean, I we worked with them. They're an investor in Lighter. Um, luckily, they weren't our provider, our capital provider, so we didn't get, uh, we weren't disrupted there. But um, you know, they strike me as a pretty conservative bank. We had a we had a loan from them. I mean, they aren't shooting from the hip, so that's that's a surprise one. And then two. I think over the 20 years, everybody that I've um, worked with at Silicon Valley Bank has just been great. It's a culture. Uh, it's a very customer focused culture filled with, you know, just genuinely nice people like you. And what's what's going to happen to those people? Do you think citizens who you know just acquired Silicon Valley Bank will be able to will want to retain a lot of them? And do you think they'll be able to retain a lot of them? Do you think they'll try to keep the Silicon Valley Bank business model intact or is this just an opportunity to buy some assets at a really low price? Well, if you look at their background, they don't have a background of doing the tech side of the business no. at all. Um, they don't have a global footprint, although um, the global footprint right now is kind of reduced quite a bit because HSBC bought all the London and European operations for one pound. You know, if I'm positive, I would say, geez, they bought it. They realized it's a good chance for franchise and supposedly an internal missives, which we've seen out on LinkedIn, whatever they, they've been sharing it. You know, they said, well, we're going to, we're going to listen, learn how you do things, you know, and then, then go from there. I, I, to me, it's always been hard from an outside entity to come into this business and do well, because the lending, if you look at the really risky lending, which is the very early stage lending, it's only 3% of their loan portfolio. But it's that 3% that drives the, um, the venture capital business, the PE business, the later stage technology business. That's what feeds all of this. And so the question is, can they get comfortable with lending money to companies that don't make money? Sometimes companies don't have revenue. Can they get comfortable with that? Now, the banks had a great track record, and you can see it in their published materials. And the chief credit officer over there is great. The, 
the, the officers underneath them understand what they're doing. So if they were smart, citizens were smart, they kind of leave them alone a little bit overseed, but leave them alone and let them, and then learn from them. The worst thing you can do is start putting their people in place. Um, uh, Sticking on the credit side, because that's where the choke point is, is I start putting my credit people in there to um, to start to take control. And then I think if that happens, I think then you'll see people start to, some people already peeled off, but I think you'll see other people start to peel off because there's a lot of other entities out there that see geez, the, the, the dominant market share leader is is now on his knees, her knees. And so we can now take advantage and grab market share for, for doing that. So optimistic is they try to hold it together, treat them as almost a separate sub and drive it that way. The downside is, is that they start to tinker. Maybe it lasts for a few months and then they start tinkering and then they slowly, the, 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 the culture and the dominant market share position just slowly Critters away. Yeah, and when I think about the assets of Silicon Valley Bank, it was it really was the people. People tend to stay at the bank for a long time, so yeah. the bank benefited from the relationships that people had in the ecosystem. So it's it's the people and the relationships those people had. So with the all you know all the VCs, the accelerators, everybody in the startup ecosystem, you know Silicon Valley Bank is well known and, and well respected in general. So. That's not something you can't, you know, teach that. I mean, you can you can teach how these people act, but you can't go teach a ten year, fifteen year relationship. If you lose those people, you'll you'll lose those those relationships. I think I think that's the biggest risk. Well, I think we covered a lot here, Mark. Thank you, and I um, it was it was a real benefit to lighter to have you as our chair while this was all happening. I think um, it helped us put a real, uh, you know, good perspective on it while it was happening, keep the panic low uh, during those few days. So thanks very much. And I'm sure this is not the end of the story. Great, thank you. Thanks again to Lighter Capital's chairman, Mark Barissimo, for sitting down with me today. Uh, Lighter Capital is the pioneer and leader in revenue-based financing. We have been providing non-dilutive capital to amazing startups over the past decade. And to hear some of the stories from other founders, you can go to lightercapital.com slash podcast. 